Um, thank you for being here. I am just so upset. <laughs> um, your intelligence just radiates from you as does your conviction. I couldn't understand everything you were saying and I spoke so quickly I couldn't follow all of it. Um, I am I am not an expert on law. I am only learning the last three or four years about the Palestinian issues and I'm doing everything I can as a, an ordinary Canadian to learn what I can about this. Um, so I come to you um, not as a, an expert on any kind of law, but as an expert on being a mom, as an expert on being a human being, and as an expert on being an ordinary global citizen. And um, so I guess what I would like is to see someone of your intelligence and contact and capability approach this as a mom in Palestine might this morning. And it is as an ordinary citizen that I look to international law to help find justice for ordinary Palestinians. Not in the greater sense of how we're going to find the final solution, but perhaps in how we find day-to-day -day justice from sunrise to sunset for ordinary families in the occupied territories. Um, and so I bring that forward as an observation and a request, not so much as a question. One more question. I don't have a mic here, so I'm gonna talk really loudly. David, you were gutsy to come to me. At any rate, um, I want to ask you a question. I asked this question before. Uh, given the new Israeli law, what? Okay, um, of making uh, Israel a Jewish state. Uh, in my reading of this, it seems to conflate uh, the criticism of Israel. To a, with the criticism of being a Jew. Hence, anti-Semitism is the charge if you're criticizing Israel. Uh, would you agree or not agree? I'd like to hear your opinion. And, uh, and this may be one of the reasons uh, many people who are very pro-Palestinians are accused of being, quote, anti-Semites. Anti or those of us who are Jewish are accused of being self-loathing Jews. What's your idea? David. Well, in terms of a particular resolution, uh, I must confess nobody before you has ever asked my opinion about it. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, and I couldn't tell you the exact wording. Um, my guess is if, if it were up to me to sit down and draft it, I would probably draft it differently from the way it's drafted because, I, of course, I have my own way of saying more or less everything. But uh, the, I, I think there is a, I mean, if you look around the world, uh, there's lots of states that are Islamic states. They have uh, the, uh, the, the crescent, the Islamic crescent uh, in, in their uh, flag. Uh, I mean, if you look at Manitoba, uh, we have a, a cross in our flag, uh, the, in the upper Union Jack, uh, across the St. George. Uh, the, uh, it, it's not uncommon for, uh, secular states to have some sort of uh, uh, ethnic or religious uh, connection. Uh, and uh, the, the way I would put it generally is I see the existence of Israel, as I, as I said in the text, as the expression of the right to, to self-determination of Jewish people. That's probably the way I would have worded the resolution. Uh, and uh, so, that, I mean, that's my own point of view. Uh, your point of view is not exactly Israeli's point of view, would you not agree? Well, maybe. I mean, as I said, I haven't uh, looked at the exact wording of the resolution. I, I mean, I, I'm usually astonished when I find anybody who agrees with exactly with everything I say, so uh, that's probably true. Okay, uh, Jeff, you want to ask So that we can take a number of questions. Okay, next question. Oh, the first question that was asked. Oh, sorry, pardon me. First question. Oh, 
Oh, first, oh, I, 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 I don't know. I'm sorry, I thought you weren't asking a question, but oh, it's kind of a reaction. Uh, yeah, uh, the uh, in terms of uh, bringing justice, well, some of the uh, issues are uh, relate to negotiations about what to do about refugees, and I mean, I, 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 I uh, as you heard in the text, reject the concept of a better return, but I do think refugees should be. There should be reparations for, for all refugees. That wasn't my comment. My comment was about people who are living day-to-day -day lives right now in the occupied territories and certainly in Gaza. I'm concerned as a mom, as a global citizen, that we use international law and decency and moral imperatives, everything we can, so that every person there has the justice and the rights that every Israeli citizen has. They have the water, they have the access to medical care, they have all the rights that you and I enjoy. That's, and you have so much knowledge and ability to influence that. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, there is a lot of uh, litigation in the courts in Israel right now about the uh, exercise of those rights, and, and that would be my reaction, insofar as rights are violated. I mean, I'm not suggesting that there's no serious accusation of any Israeli violation of human rights, but my suggestion is that when that happens, that the, the remedies exist in Israel and they should be invoked. And if they don't work after being invoked, then that's the time to go to the international arena. But th there is regular efforts. Uh, I mean, a lot of the Israeli newspapers exist in English, uh, Jerusalem Post, the Times of Israel, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and a lot of the news reports in those papers are reports of litigation around those issues. So uh, uh, I would say that the way to, to remedy those defects is, is to invoke Israeli law and invoke Israeli courts. Hi, David. Uh, could you please uh, speak to the legal status of the Israeli settlements in the West Bank? Yeah, I, I just sort of uh, go over that. Uh, I sort of skip over that because that was one of the concluding um, uh, recommendations. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a point uh, to which uh, and Mr. Link uh, adverted as well about occupations. Uh, the, the, the West Bank and Gaza are sometimes called the occupied territories, but they're not, that is not the name of the territories, that's an opinion, uh, an international legal opinion. Uh, and we heard the indication of uh, the Fourth Geneva Convention on the Laws of War, but if you look at the Fourth Geneva Convention on the Laws of War, it talks about an occupying power and an occupied state. So uh, who, who's the occupied state here? Uh, well, uh, historically, it used to be uh, Jordan and Egypt, uh, because the West Bank and Gaza were uh, taken from Jordan. But there's now peace treaties uh, between uh, Jordan and Israel, Egypt and Israel, and Egypt and Jordan have renounced all claims uh, over the uh, territory. What we have instead now is, is a claim that the Palestinian people uh, are uh, the occupied part, but, uh, and I realize that the Palestinians uh, lately have uh, proclaimed a state, but it's not generally recognized. Canada doesn't recognize it. And, and the fact of the matter is that legally, if, uh, if Israel is an occupying power under the Geneva Conventions now uh, for, uh, for uh, the West Bank and Gaza, then Jordan and Egypt would have had to have been the occupying power then, before the, the 60s. Wars uh, for uh, Jordan and Egypt, and they they were not described then as occupying powers, and they are not described now retrospectively as occupying powers. I, I think the vocabulary of occupations that in, in, uh, in settlements is is, uh, is legal, it's judgmental, and it's mistaken. I mean, there are of course Jewish residents there, but as I point out in my written text. There are fewer Jewish residents in absolute numbers and percentage of population in the West Bank and Gaza. Well, in Gaza, they, they all have to be evacuated. But in, in, in the West Bank, then there are Arabs uh, within the Green Line. Uh, and uh, the, rather than suggest that there shouldn't be Jewish residents of Israeli national residents in the West Bank, the, uh, the, the formula for peace 
should apply to the West Bank, that the Israeli, the, the Jews, and the Arabs in the West Bank should be able to live side by side in peace. And, and, and the notion that you can have uh, the two states uh, living side by side in peace, but all the Jews have to be evacuated, is, is, is in my view, not a sound foundation, uh, both practically and in international law review. Have any of you ever heard of an illegal unicorn? It doesn't exist. I mean, David, I, I, I think your, your opinion is, a, is an extraordinary minority, both in the world and among legal scholars. Um, there are over 40 UN Security Council resolutions saying that um, the Palestinian territory of Gaza, East Jerusalem, and West Bank is occupied. There are several hundred General Assembly resolutions passed by overwhelming majorities Showing in the range of about 150 votes to about seven or eight, which say that the territories are occupied. You have authority, authoritative bodies like the International Court of Justice, like the International um, Committee of the Red Cross, the high contracting parties to the Fourth Geneva Convention, all saying that the territories are, uh, are occupied. This, this really comes to very close to being a flat earth uh, society uh, opinion. First of all, why are these territories considered occupied? Under the Geneva Conventions and the laws of occupation, the uh, test is, does, were these territories acquired by a foreign army on a foreign territory during an armed conflict? Um, and the answer is yes. Israel, Jordan, and Egypt were all signatories to the, uh, to the Geneva Conventions at the time of war in 1967. Um, and if you look at the 2016 International Committee Red Cross Commentary, it says it doesn't matter who had um, legitimate uh, uh, sovereign rights over the territories that have come under control of the foreign occupying army at the time of the armed conflict. Those, that, those lands come under, uh, under occupation, and the full thrust of the Fourth Geneva Convention winds up applying. The test is effective control. So among the overwhelming number of legal scholars, including a number of very prominent Israeli legal scholars like Ariel Gross, like um, A.L. Uh, ben Benisti, uh, like Yaron Dinstein, uh, like Orna Ben Naftali, like Theodore Mera, uh, who I've just quoted, even most of these leading Israeli uh, international legal scholars say that the territories are occupied, the Fourth Geneva Convention applies, uh, and keep in mind, that these territories, even if we accept some basis for the argument coming from David and coming from the uh, and coming from Israel, those territories, even if under in uh, through the division, the partition of Palestine in 1947 under Re Resolution 181, were never promised, were never granted to uh, Israel. Um, the East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and uh, and the Gaza Strip were not. Uh, uh, we're not given there. And the last point I want to make is this. This all comes from a very old notion that is now antiquated and disappeared from international thinking and from international law about who owns the territory. In the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, the whole concept was that imperial powers could wind up deciding who owns what territory over the heads of the indigenous peoples that lived there. Among other things, that's how Canada wound up getting divided up. That was dying a death at the end of the First World War. It still had some life left in it, some last breaths, when we had the Belfort Declaration, the San Remo Resolution of 1920, and the League of Nations mandate in 1922. But by the end of the Second World War, and certainly by the beginning of the 1960s, the realization had changed and changed utterly that the sovereign power of any particular country are the people who wind up living there. And the Palestinians in 1967 lived in overwhelming numbers in the West Bank, in East Jerusalem, uh, and in Gaza. So um, there, is, there is no conceivable basis for any legitimate Israeli claim to be able to say that they have any sort of uh, sovereign title to the, to the land. That's why they're so energetically building settlements 
the whole point of the Israeli settlement enterprise in East Jerusalem and the West Bank is to create the demographic, demographic facts on the ground to be able to establish a, a sovereign claim for title by creating a critical mass of Jewish settlers who cannot be, uh, who cannot be removed. But the world has consistently rejected that. Um, the world rejected in July 1967 the, uh, the claim of the annexation of uh, Jerusalem. And by 1979, the uh, United Nations Security Council was already saying that the settlements are an impediment to law, to peace. They are illegal. The territory is occupied. And no authoritative body has suggested since anything since then. Both of you for your uh, very learned answers. Um, we're going to take two questions, and I would like you each to ask just one question and be very succinct. And we'll see if our, our uh, answerers here, our panelists, can also be succinct because we're getting close to the end. Hello, Mr. Minis. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, one of the things you said was that um, see, international law has been used and misused against Israel. Um, I've been in Palestine four times as a member of ISM in the West Bank. I've seen Israeli soldiers humiliate Palestinians at checkpoints. I have seen people getting arrested for expressing their mothers being insulted. I've seen Palestinian kids shot from bullets and with live fire, whereas Israeli settler kids were allowed to throw rocks at Palestinians. Um, I have seen Israeli soldiers abuse and settlers under the soldiers' um, supervision, abuse Palestinians' rights every single day when I was there each of the four summers. Um, it is not a misuse or abuse of international law to, um, to speak against Israel's crimes. It's a misuse to not say anything and not protest them. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, originally, you started out with saying you were skeptical about international law. And that's all the more reason, in a way, to say that the rest of us are cynical about international law, because it has not been applied, because you're skeptical about it. And what you've done, I believe, is you've sidestepped, you've ignored, and you've dismissed international law. And if international law will not be the framework for these hallowed negotiations that we hear about, what is the framework? Because you've completely discounted international law. negotiations is past negotiations and the agreements that have been signed, the, the roadmap, the Oslo Accord, the, the Y settlement and so on. Uh, those goes on for pages and pages and, uh, and I suggest that you've got a, a pretty good framework already negotiated and settled. Well, the first one, uh, I, I mean, uh, it, it sort of see, it seemed like a, a statement that he had seen uh, abuses at, at the checkpoints. And I mean, I don't think that's what you say, but the, uh, I, I mean, I assume that what you, 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 you said you saw, you actually saw uh, the, uh, but, and this was uh, related to a, a, a question that was raised earlier, that my reaction to abuse that occurs by uh, Israeli soldiers is use local Israeli remedies to the uh, maximum extent possible. If at the end of the day they fail, then there may be recourse in the international arena. But the notion that you go first to the UN, I think, is misplaced. If, if I can just briefly uh, uh, mention that one of the things that David had mentioned, I think, during his uh, uh, initial uh, presentation to us was the um, was it was regrettable that people would turn to international forums and international courts because most of these, most if not all of these issues, could wind up being uh, resolved fairly and efficiently through Israeli courts. I want to say that that's probably not a, an option anymore. The Israeli uh, Supreme Court uh, and the Israeli courts beneath it, according to Israeli human rights lawyers and according to Israeli um, NGOs, 
have become a handmaiden of the occupation. Um, and you can see the, uh, never once through the 40 years that the, that the Israeli Supreme Court has been ruling on Israeli settlements, settling in the occupied territory, confiscating either public or private international land to do so. Never once has an Israeli court ever ruled on the legality of uh, moving civilian settlers, settlers into occupied territory under international law. Never once is it referred to the Fourth Geneva Convention, in particular Article 49, with respect to that. It's all been done under the auspices of, uh, of domestic law. In the most recent ruling, last Wednesday, the Israeli Supreme Court, which is becoming more and more conservative in the same trend that you would see in the United States with respect to the appointment of more and more deliberately conservative judges, ruled against the final appeal of the Bedouin Palestinian um, tribe that occupies a small village of Qain al Amar, just outside of Israel, uh, sorry, just outside of uh, Jerusalem, ruling that they had failed to apply the local planning laws and therefore could wind up being moved, even though they had lived there for the last 30 years, even though they had filed a number of applications asking to have their settlement, their village uh, regularized under Israeli planning laws pertaining to the uh, um, uh, pertaining to uh, settlement in Area C. Um, at the same time, there had been a ruling several days before with respect to the uh, allowing a, a, an illegal Israeli outpost, and I say illegal even under Israeli planning laws, um, that they had purchased the land in good faith, believing that it had been uh, honorably taken from another Palestinian family under, um, under Israeli rules. And as long as it was done in good faith, even though it had been expropriated uh, without compensation to Palestinians, that's sufficient to be able to legalize these Palestinian outputs. So the thought that um, Palestinians, on any major issue dealing with the occupation, could ever find justice in Israeli courts, I think that is a legal unicorn. We'll take all three questions now. Super quick. Yeah, very quick. So the the Israeli-Palestine conflict, the occupation is is unique. It's it's I believe the longest occupation in modern history, um, and certainly uh, is unique in a lot of other capacities as well in terms of an asymmetric conflict. Um, but I think that there might be something to learn. Or I, my question is: Is is there something to learn from other um, decolonization or, or other solutions to similar conflicts in the past, Northern Ireland, South Africa. Is there anything we can take from those that can be applied here in a useful fashion? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, Let's take my three questions. Shalom and salam alaikum, David. Um, and I'm glad to hear you recognize the kinship between your Arab brethren. Uh, I believe I've also heard here that there is a problematic uh, a situation when you have two states divided by race and ethnicity is the primary dividing line between those two states. And I believe there was a suggestion put forward that perhaps the Arab and Jewish people living together as one state under equal protection of the law might be a longer term solution. So I would like to know, David, how you think about that as a possibility. The last question. There's a, ri there's a rising, uh, or there's a tide change taking place within the Jewish community with regard to Israel. For example, Henry Sigmund, former head of the American Jewish Congress, has called upon Israel to stop killing Palestinians and end the occupation. Would you attribute this tide change to Jews' increasing embrace of anti-Semitism? <laughs> well, the yes. last question is easy to answer, no. <laughs> uh, but I'll, I'll get back to the, the, all of the, all of the yeah. attempt to answer in the sequence. Um, about uh, learning from other conflicts, I mean, there is, of course, some, uh, at least one other long-standing con uh, conflict of occupation. I can think of the Chinese occupation of Tibet. But uh, the, and, and there's been a long-standing one about the 
with Mauritania and, and uh, Morocco, uh, uh, Morocco occupying some of Mauritania's territory. But the, uh, and of course we've got, I mean, we've got the recent one with Crimea, but uh, in terms of West of Ireland and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and South Africa, well, I mean, I don't see those conflicts having been resolved as a result of the application of international law. International law may have helped in some ways, hopefully, but what I see uh, is uh, the, the leadership made a big difference. Uh, and, you know, right now we have an exhibit at the King Museum for Human Rights about Nelson Mandela. And, and Mandela, to a lesser extent, the clerk made a big difference. I would say if you look at the uh, What's going on in the past in Israel? I think that, that uh, the uh, Sadat made a big difference, uh, and uh, he, he, he unfortunately was assassinated. And his he, he uh, the counterpart also was assassinated. Uh, the Israeli uh, the negotiating partner, and uh, the uh, and that pushed back uh, the peace process. Uh, those two assassinations. Uh, the and, and uh, so uh, right now, the, the trouble with international law, I mean, just generally, is that it kind of puts people in fixed positions. You know, I'm right and you're wrong, sort of thing. Whereas uh, negotiations require some sort of give and take and, and reconciliation. And uh, so uh, I, I would uh, I, I would think, you know, that's you know, when I look at the, the Ireland example or the uh, South African example, that's what I pick up for them. Um, as, as for the uh, sort of one state uh, uh, solution, I mean, I don't think you can talk about a solution with what I did without identifying the problem. And, uh, and the, I, guess, I guess you could say the problem is the absence of peace, but uh, the question is having with one state end that. They're, the advocates of the one state uh, solution are not just uh, anti Zionists or, or anti Israel. I mean, there's a lot of people, I mean, in the, in the far right uh, that, that advocate the, the one state solution. Uh, because uh, the, the opponents historically have been people who say the demographics is against the Jewish population with the one state solution, but other people say the demographics is not so, and, and therefore uh, there should be a one state solution. I mean, this is a debate within the right, but uh, my own view is, uh, and I think there's, um, I, I, I'm not sure I, I disagree with uh, what Michael Link said, is saying when he says I'm uh, 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 a bit distinctive in my international law views, that may well be the case. But uh, when it comes to a two-state solution, that seems pretty well to be a consensus. Uh, and uh, I, I see that uh, in, in a lot of international uh, resolutions, and, and to a certain extent it makes sense, because uh, that way each uh, of the two peoples would be able to exercise the right to self-determination independently, rather than having one as a majority and one, and one as a minority uh, in a single state. Uh, it, the, uh, the third question about whether uh, American Jews are becoming anti-Semites, I would say no. I mean, it, uh, this has got to do with the, the question of when criticism of Israel becomes an anti-Semitism. Uh, and uh, it, there is, I mean, it, this too is not such a difficult issue to, to resolve, and, and I don't have a particular individual opinion about it. I did refer to the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, which does deal specifically with that issue, and I did quote from it, and it goes on at great length. Uh, I mean, it's a lengthy. It, well, it, the way it's structured, it's got kind of a one or two sentence uh, heading and, and a lot of examples, but uh, some of the examples deal with that issue, and, and that definition has been accepted by uh, pretty well. It comes out of the Holocaust Remembrance Alliance Association, but that uh, it's an intergovernmental organization with a lot of members and. and Canada itself has uh, adopted the, that definition. Uh, so that would be my answer to the third question. Thank you. We'll ask Michael to give a brief response, and then David, you can have the final word, a short one, but the final word. Um, I quoted to you earlier on when I was speaking from the uh, I, uh, from the very intriguing article that Theodore Marin had written that David Gattenberg had so kindly 
uh, produced. I urge you all to you get a chance to read it in its entirety. It's uh, Yes, it is legal, but I think there's a lot that can be gleaned from it. One of the things that uh, he quotes towards the end is, a, um, is an American um, expert on international law, uh, Richard Baxter, who said the first line of defense against international humanitarian law is to deny that it applies at all. And this is generally the, the approach by those who, have, who know they have a, le le a weak legal case um, to be able to say international law doesn't matter, international law doesn't apply, um, these arguments wind up disqualifying it. Um, I can't think of another situation, another conflict in the world where there's been so much law that has been compiled through the variety of UN resolutions, through commentaries by, uh, by diplomats and by legal scholars, uh, and which is so overwhelmingly pointing in, in one particular direction. So from that point of view, I can see why some would say it shouldn't matter or it doesn't apply because the law is so greatly against it. And the other thing I just want to pick up is, uh, um, is just a comment again on your wonderful museum of, uh, of human rights here. And David briefly mentioned, David Maitis briefly mentioned that. Uh, and I was particularly intrigued by the, um, by the temporary exhibit on Nelson Mandela. And Mandela once said, after he was freed, that we must realize that our freedom is, is incomplete until the Palestinians have achieved justice. I think that's something we should all keep in mind. Thank you very much. Just one final word from David, since he's our keynote speaker at this session. Yeah, well, obviously there's a lot of different points to be raised, but maybe uh, I'll just deal with this last one about the Geneva Convention. So it's true that uh, okay, it, it's true that I said that uh, the uh, Geneva Convention don't apply. The position of Israel is that, if, as I understand it, is that even though it, it, it doesn't uh, apply, they, they will respect it. And so uh, it, that is, and I'm not suggesting they don't respect it, uh, although there could be issues about it, and as I say, they could be litigated and potentially even brought to the international arena if local litigation fails. Although I would say we, we shouldn't use uh, the international arena as a, a final appeal, appeal for it. There has to be something malfunctioning rather than disagreement with the decision. Uh, and in terms of moving people uh, to the uh, West Bank, which is a phrase that uh, Professor Link used, that isn't happening. Uh, people are moving, but they're not being carted out there. Uh, they're moving voluntarily. And my interpretation, uh, again, uh, with, which, with which some of you may disagree, is that the Geneva Conventions prohibits forcible movement. It doesn't prohibit voluntary transfers. I mean, that's kind of a technical point on which to end, but I think I will end there. <laughs> and if I, if I can just say briefly, uh, David, you know what the, what the argument is on that. You're citing from Article 49, Paragraph 1, which prohibits forcible transfer. The relevant article is Article 49, Paragraph 6, which I think most people in this room would have seen yesterday, and there's no mention forcible transfer. The prohibition under the Geneva Convention, under the additional protocol in 1977, and under the 1998 Statute of Rome is the transfer directly or indirectly of a civilian population. The word forcible is not there. Okay, thank you. Um,